So at this point, I will hand over to Lorraine Rose for our first presentation. I'm in a number of um, community of practices. Um, I read a lot of articles, follow a lot of, a lot of blogs, um, but I'm the community of practices I'm involved in are both locally in Australia, but also some international uh, groups. And there are a lot of health librarians. I'm also, the pictures on the screen are from things like X and LinkedIn, and these little snapshots give good summaries of the discussions we're having and how these tools, the many plethora of tools that are out there, can be used in the research process. I also attended the Australian Evidence-Based Practice Librarians Institute last year, and we had some really good discussions on using AI tools in systematic reviews. So AI has become an indispensable companion for researchers across various domains. Its ability to handle vast amounts of data, streamline tasks, augment human capabilities makes it a valuable asset in the research landscape. AI tools are our research assistants, and even though they haven't replaced any part of that systematic literature review process, they are a really valuable addition to the process and they help save time and inefficiencies as well. So some of the ways I'm leveraging AI tools um, are in different places in research processes and in the literature review process. I use them in that initial scoping the literature and brainstorming a research question. So this is where AI tools can assist by saving time and reducing effort. They allow discovery based on context without the need for keywords and so can quickly highlight relevant articles. Some tools such as SciSpace offer suggestions for research questions as well. And then in the seminal article, so in the systematic review process, one of the initial steps is to find the gold set or seed articles that we want to find at the end of the review and AI tools have been really useful in this step. Uh, then finally, in the well, not finally, but part of the hand searching process. So at the end of the traditional database searching in a systematic review, there is the process of hand searching and citation searching. AI tools are really useful in this phase, both to save time and ensure you're finding all the literature. As you can see, they don't replace the process of constructing searches and running these through the databases but they assist in making sure we've found all the literature available on a certain topic. And then finally in the screening and the data extraction processes, um, for example, Covidence has some AI built in to sort your screening. So the most relevant uh, articles appear first and there's other tools um, like AS Review uh, that also um, use AI for the screening process. These tools will be used more and more to assist workflow and for data analysis. Uh, SciSpace has some really good data extraction capabilities as well that could be used in data extraction for systematic and scoping reviews. When I think about choosing the right tools, there's no one size fits all. There are various free and paid AI tools such as SciSpace, Connected Papers, Research Rabbit, Semantic Scholar and Elicit. Um, for example, I was using Elicit for the initial brainstorming of a research question and as part of the initial search to find seminal articles. But then Elicit changed to a credit based model and I quickly used up all my credits and you have to pay for all the good features. So then I moved to SciSpace. Now, interestingly enough, just last week, Elicit sent an email saying they had reopened up their free model and the credit system had gone. But I think it's a real a good example of how all these tools are constantly changing and not one tool is going to fit what we want to achieve. So we can swap from one to another and we've just got to be open to moving around, particularly if we want to leverage all the free versions of these tools. Um, when using these AI tools, I think it's really important to think about a couple of things so we can make responsible and ethical choices when using them. So I like to know the data source of the tool I'm using. I, I like to know what is the large language model they're using. Um, and what's happening to my data that I'm inputting into the tool too. So I'm 
constantly looking at the privacy policies or the frequently asked questions of these tools to try to come up with these answers. And sometimes the answers aren't there for certain tools, um, but I think we can keep looking and trying to find uh, this information out so we can make a good choice with the tools that we're using. Then I think it's this builds on to this building AI literacy. So making sure that researchers aware, are aware of the risks, limitations and issues with AI. We've got to ensure we make good decisions about using the AI tools. So what access levels do we have? What happens to our data? What data has the tool been trained on? We need to think critically about the outputs, um, looking for accuracy of them, bias involved, the false references or hallucinations, and then acknowledge the use of these tools to avoid academic misconduct and plagiarism. Considering these aspects of AI tools ensures we can use them ethically and responsibly. The AI tools are here to assist, but not replace human expertise, especially in literature reviews. So at Charles Sturt, we have um, developed some resources for helping researchers um, use AI tools. Uh, we've got an open educational resource using AI tools at university, um, and it's got information for both students, so undergrads and researchers, on using tools um, while studying and undertaking research. But let's just dive into a couple of quick demonstrations now. Um, so first of all, I'm going to start in SciSpace, and this is an example of an AI tool that combines searching with a large language model. So it has a, a chat GPT-like functionality. Now the data is from Semantic Scholar and Open Alex, plus it uses its own crawlers that crawl websites to get the information as well. Um, now how I'm using SciSpace is for initially brainstorming that research question and putting, um, trying to find some seminal articles so first of all, I'll put a research question into SciSpace to see what comes up. It doesn't so much like keywords. It likes a question with a question mark. And, um, and then it will give a summary of some papers that it's found. And it's just taking a little while with the internet. But what, um, so it's using its large language model to give a summary of the papers it finds surrounding this question, and then it will list a number of papers. Um, these papers that it lists, I'll always check to make sure they actually exist, because I'm always wary of those hallucinations. Um, and here we go, it's finally loading. Um, so we've got an insight from the top papers some of the top five papers at the top. So this is our quick summary that it's provided. Um, and you can see how it actually links to papers. So it does give you the references to where it got that information from. Then I'll just point out here, I can use C related questions. So if we're brainstorming a research question, this is something I can show the researchers, look, maybe here's some other ideas, different directions we could go. If I scroll down here, we've got a list of all our papers that it's found. I can limit this to top tier papers. And if I tick this box, it actually changes the summary at the top because it's only now looking at the top tier papers. When it says top tier papers, it's actually linking to um, Samago. So getting the Q1, Q2 journals from Samago. Then it's listed some papers here um, and there's, I've got different columns on the right hand side and I can scroll across to look at the different columns and I can actually add some more columns. So just say I didn't want limitations, I wanted the methods. I can change these columns around. And this is the free version of SciSpace. I've signed up for a free account but um, I'm only allowed five columns, I think, with the free version. So there are some restri restrictions with the free version. Unfortunately, I can't export these references in the free version, um, but there's plenty of functionality here. So I would then, I mean, you can see that some have a PDF, but I would copy and paste titles into the library catalog to check that these are real articles that exist. 
Um, you, we can open up these articles as well and view the abstract and also chat with the paper so we can ask questions which SciSpace will then try to answer. Now, there's some other functionalities with this platform. You can upload PDFs and then ask the SciSpace to summarize the PDF or find insights out of that PDF. So an option for data extraction with systematic reviews as well. But right now, I'll move on to the other demo I wanted to give, and this is Research Rabbit. I've again logged in. Um, Research Rabbit is free and there's no premium version. It um, states it's always going to stay free. But what I really like about Research Rabbit is if I go into the help section on the right hand side and the frequently asked questions, I get answers to a lot of the questions I alluded to earlier in my slides. So if I scroll down here, I've got a section on data, algorithm, algorithms and search. So where does the data come from? It's going to tell me, which is great. Um, Research Rabbit gets um, it, uh, its data from PubMed and Semantic Scholar, and it's a little bit different to SciSpace because it's a literature mapping tool. But then it talks about here, how does the recommendation engine work? How does the search engine work? So it's really good to know that it's quite transparent with how it's finding the articles. Now, to find articles, in this um, AI, AI tool, we can set up a collection on the left-hand side. I've already set up a collection, but I'll add some more papers to this. Now we could look for an individual paper by its title, or we can put in some keywords here and search. And then we're given a choice to search PubMed or Semantic Scholar. And I'm giving a list of what it thinks are related articles, and I can add these into a collection. Once I've added a few into the collection, I can get out of this page. And here is my collection in this column on the left. I can click on any of these and it will give me an abstract. Then I can see the reference list. So Research Rabbit is a really good tool for that citation um, tracking or reference list checking. Um, so I can view the whole reference list here and anything that I think should be added, I can add to the collection, so I can keep building up that collection. But one thing that's really nice is it also lists the citations. So this is where I can do that citation tracking, so I can see what has cited this article since it was published. And again, I can view these articles. If I think it's suitable, I'll add it into the collection. Then once I've done that, I can go back and any of these articles that I need to add into my literature review, I can then export them as an RIS file. And just before I finish up today, I just wanted to show a couple of slide, uh, one slide on how these tools are being reported in the literature. So here's an example of a um, search strategy that's used Research Rabbit in the search strategy. It's done the traditional database searching but it has also included Research Rabbit as part of its search. And here's another example where they've used Elicit and SciSpace as part of their search strategy in the Prisma flow diagram. But that brings me to the end of my presentation today, and I'm very happy to answer some questions.